And when you eat the processed American diet, it affects your brain. It damages your neurons. It decreases your creativity, your ability for your brain to function and be creative and think and be intelligent. The brain is under attack. The episodic high glucose from all those sugar and sweets and maple syrup and honey, all the things you're throwing in and the white, and the white products that you're eating. It makes you hopeless. It makes you sick. And it makes you depressed. Processed food causes depression. There's a link between the consumption of commercial baked goods and fast food and major depression. Even two servings a week of commercial baked goods, like a bagel or a croissant or a pizza and a burger, two servings a week doubles your risk of developing depression. 51% higher risk of developing depression from two servings a week. And it goes up from there in a dose-dependent manner. The more fast food you eat, the higher the risk of depression you develop. Just two servings a week. Here's what I'm saying, though. What if you're one of those people who are eating fast food, and most Americans are eating more than two servings a week. They're eating white flour, you know, three or four servings a day, and fast food four to eight servings a week. And what about those people that don't get depressed? They're still brain damaged. Their brain is altered. And most Americans now have chronic dysthymia, which means that they no longer have enthusiasm about life. They're not totally depressed, but they've lost their... Real, that real enthusiasm and happiness and positivity. And they've lost their being hopeful about life. And they just function and move around, kind of like in a fog. They're not depressed, but they're not really a full, a full human either. They're like an automaton. What are those movies where the people like, are walking like they're half, like they're dead, and they're walking through the invasion of the body snatchers? What are those people called? Those Zombies! Zombies. Right, that's the word, zombies. We're fast food zombies in this country. We've zombified our minds. Withdrawal depression happens every time a toxic substance is withdrawn from the body. When you stop eating junk food, you feel mild depression, and it triggers the use of alcohol and drugs. We have a whole population of people sucking in poisons. The National Bureau of Economic Research reports that people who have a mental illness, which is now a big percent of Americans, and I'm saying most Americans are mildly dysthymic anyway, consume 69% of the nation's alcohol and 84% of the nation's cocaine. Why'd they get that way? Why'd they become, well, from the processed foods that destroy the brain? And if you're diabetic or you're overweight, then you've destroyed plenty of your brain. You can't this the idea that people think that junk food and overeating and being overweight just causes diabetes and heart disease and cancer and doesn't destroy your brain just as much as that's going on, that's crazy and irrational. You're losing your brain function, you're destroying your brain, you're destroying the rest of your body. You can't keep your brain function while you're eating poorly. And the amount of health in your healthy diet affects your intelligence, your production of school performance, your economic productivity, your excitement about life, your creativity, And, of course, the development of serious disease like autism. We can't... It's what we're doing to our kids. And you know what? There's a link between higher intake of sugar and fast food before age 10 and later life criminal behavior, criminal activity, and dr illegal drug use. We always say that by the way, it says no other variable, not poverty, not social isolation, not bad parenting, not abusive parenting, not living in an orphanage, not economic deprivation. No other variable is as powerful as the consumption of candy and fast food in childhood and later life drug abuse. You're following this a serious issue. You've got to be insane to eat fast food. But if you're not, it's okay. It makes you insane. Now, once you're a food addict, it takes over your brain, it takes over your thinking. You just want to keep, you just want to be a food addict. Makes you uncomfortable or anxious to try to call change. Change is uncomfortable. You have anxiety just thinking about eating a healthy diet. But you don't solve your emotional problems in life by maintaining your addictions. Your addictions direct you away from the problems in your life 
and takes you away from solving the problems in your life. You can't make your life, your life right while you're seeking your addictive substance of choice. You can't be an alcoholic and be the best parent you can be. You can't be a cocaine addict and be the best productive worker and be the best thinker and start to be, and write, be the best writer and be the best artist and be the best person for your community or the earth or the world. You can't be the best. You're just a shell of who you could be when you're an addict. And you can't be eating donuts and croissants and pizza and bacon and hot dog rolls. You can't be sickly and overweight and expect to be the full human being. You can be because you're just a shell of yourself. When people come into our facility and I watch them recover and lose the weight, it's amazing. Their whole personalities change. Who they are as a person change from complaining and being irritable and unable to appreciate anything about their life or about anybody else or being interested in other people or being able to see the instruction um, the aesthetic structure of the world and appreciate nature and, and beauty and excitement. They, their whole life changes. The fog lifts. They become a different individual. These food addictions take over their mind, have taken over their mind. And the brain wants to protect the... Remember, you are not the full you. Your addictions have taken over the bank. And that, those addictions, one of the most irrational and illogical reasons, self-delusional thoughts of why it's not the right time for you to change your diet, not the right time for you to eat healthy, why you can't possibly do this, you know. You have some excuse why you shouldn't be eating healthily, right? Some excuse. That's not real. There's no excuse. There's no reason that it can ever override why you should take better care of your health. And there's no reason why you should put it off. You shouldn't have put it off this long. When's the time to quit smoking? Yeah, a long time ago, but obviously if you're still smoking now, it's funny because I run these getaways and healthy, and people come into the getaway and they're eating all this healthy food and I start talking to them across the table and they start telling me they smoke, they, and I find out that they're smoking cigarettes. I go, what are you doing here eating a healthy diet if you're still smoking cigarettes? You're gonna, what's the whole point? Stop smoking right now. Today, now, this minute. If you're going to flood the body with nutrients, it's painful to stop smoking. It's painful to stop to come off of your diet, but do it. Why take another day of destructive behavior that may cause some damage and make and why continue the damage? There's no excuse. An excuse is no excuse. There's no excuse to poison yourself. But some people need extra help. Right? Because this is serious things we're talking about here. And people are psychologically destroyed and they look to food for loneliness and because they've been abused or because they have a horrible life and they've looked for food for comfort and they've developed that illicit love affair with poisonous food and they need help recovering from that. Sometimes they need psychological counseling and go and it goes into their life of what they, how they became so troubled. Sometimes they need some help to get out of the depression Withdrawal depression, maybe with some natural substances like saf saffron or, or salmon or 5-HTP. Maybe they need some help. You know, light, we, we, in other words, we want to make it, and I certainly want to make it possible for people to make the change to good health. And if people are, have, are struggling, as a physician specializing in people recovering from food addiction and, and recovering from illnesses, I want to give them the tools, the structure, and the help they need to make this recovery work and to make sure that they stick with it for the rest of their life and they don't fall back. It happens so much that people will go on to some healthy program or they'll go away you know, from a place a week or two and they'll come back and they'll just go back to their old diet and get their weight back again. They waste, if they didn't get to solving the obstacles in their life and what caused them to be a food addict to begin with, it's not going to stick. Poor self-esteem makes doing this more difficult People look to get, when, you, when you're an addict and when you have poor self-esteem, you're looking for the approval of other people. You live for the approval of other people. When you feel good about yourself and what you're doing, when you feel that you're, when you're, the underlying structure of your life is based on fairness and consideration, and being an, an asset to other people in need, 
and you feel good about yourself, you don't need to go after other people's approval. When a person's confronting you about your diet, why do you eat that way? Where do you get your protein? Blah, 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 blah. Whatever. You don't feel the need. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to make this person like you. You're not, you don't have to impress anybody. Your thought process is now revolving around how you can be useful to this person, how you can have the best effect on their life and possibly, maybe possibly, have some good effect on them, have goodwill for them. You no longer, it's no longer about you, it's about them because you don't need to protect your own self. You feel good enough about your, you don't have a problem with your own ego, your own self-worth. You know what, well, take care of yourself first, put the oxygen mask on yourself, be a role model, and then get the reward and satisfaction from being useful to others. It's not about arguing or protecting yourself, or pleasing another person. It's being able to be the full you, so you can get the full creativity out of your own abilities to be the best person you can be. Enable you to help other people better and have a life with better purpose. And build your self-esteem with compassion. This person's, they've been getting the wrong information and they have food driving their behavior. It's not their fault that they don't, that they're doing, thinking the wrong way, they're not doing the best thing for their life. It's not their, not, you don't have to blame them personally, right? You just have to think of how I can have the best effect on them and really think what's the best thing to have a better effect on their life. And maybe it's not going to help them. But just maybe because you were a good example and maybe because you expressed how much you love taking better care of your health and you, and you have, you know, you, and you're feeling to want them to be healthier too, whatever it was, maybe a year from now they'll think about that. Maybe you did have a remarkable influence on their life, and maybe you did help their life dramatically, but you know what? The minute you're afraid to hide who you, afraid to show who you are, the minute you want to get a, you want to blend in, and you want to eat, and you want to go to a, a food, a, a family gathering, or a party, and, and, and hide that you're eating differently, you're too ashamed of what you're doing, you're looking to please other people, and you, somebody's wanting you, and you don't want to imba um, offend a person by not eating what they made, or the minute you're trying to think of, your mind is preoccupied with other people are thinking of you. The minute you do that, you've lost your opportunity to have goodwill for another person. It's the opportunity, it's not always going to happen, it's the opportunity to have, to have an to influence somebody positively. You want to have, be a leader, and you want to have the mindset of a champion. And that takes practice, and repetition, and determination, and perseverance, and a correct attitude. And when you do that, this works really nicely, and it becomes fun and exciting. Remember, you don't get to be like a ta champion, like athlete or tennis player or something, from, with a little bit of effort has to be many, many years of hard work. But here's the thing. What if this person were, gave 90% effort, or 90%, 95% effort? They'd get zero out of it. 90 or 9 to 5% effort gives you back nothing. Because all the money is in the last 5%. You get what I'm saying right now? If you have your foot in both worlds, keep dabbling in unhealthy foods where you're trying to eat healthy. You keep reestablishing those triggers that pull you into an addictive way of thinking that make this difficult to do it. Once you're fully committed, there's no more stress, no more decision making, no more the brain being forced to go back and forth, no more struggling with decisions. You've already fully decided and you're fully committed. Once you're fully committed and fully decided, there's no stress, zero stress. But then the miracles happen. Then the change happens. I used to teach ice skating. I used to tell my students, you're doing great, but you're not going to get anything out of this. Because doing it 90%, just, you know, you're not going to get an Olympic, you're not going to be in the Olympics, you're not going to make a lot of money, you're not gonna, you know, if you really want to you know, get something out of it, you've got to do it 100%. But it's ever so much here, but more important with food. I see so many people, I've been, as a physician specializing in nutritional medicine, I've been doing this more than 30 years now. And the biggest disappointment in my life is seeing the sick people that failed because they didn't follow through and do this. They knew about it. They learned about it. They got excited about it. And then they couldn't do it for some reason, which you're learning about. That's troubling to me.
That was always troubling to me. And I've spent the last 20 years of my life trying to help people remove the obstacles to those changes so they can succeed. So we, can, so we don't have to leave people that want to change and want to get better, throw them out and not give them a chance. So the path to great health and true hunger, don't eat till you feel full or stuffed. You want to be hungry for the next meal. So how much can you eat at lunch? How much do you know how much to eat? Well, I'll tell you how much you eat at lunch. You want to eat the right amount so you get hungry again before you eat dinner. If you overrate at lunch, you're not going to get hungry for dinner. If you overeat dinner, you're not going to be hungry in time for breakfast. Keep eating less so you can try to get hungry before the next meal. If you got through halfway through the afternoon and you're starving already before three or two or three hours before lunch, before dinner, then you didn't eat enough food. And if you're not losing a pound every three days, and if you're overweight and not losing a pound every day, every, if you're not losing a pound every three days or two pounds a week, then you're overeating. I can't assure that you're not going to overeat, but I know that if you eat this high nutrient diet style, you're going to be very comfortable eating the right amount of calories, and it makes it so it's no longer uncomfortable to eat the right amount of calories. It makes it possible for you to eat, eat the right amount with comfort, and you're not driven to try to force calories down your throat. So a nutritarian, the word nutritarian means you're recognizing that what you eat makes who you are and how you think and how you behave. It doesn't just determine your health. It determines how you think. Your ability to be a logical thinker and be influenced by and to be able to weigh information better and make better decisions. And you're not governed by your unrelenting need to be a people pleaser. You want to be useful to, the, to humanity and other people. But you don't want, but it's not about by getting more ego for yourself. It's not about how people see you. Your happiness is based on how you see them. Your happiness is based on how much you can emote, how much you can love, how much you can care for other people, how much you can care for the world around you, how much you can respect and appreciate reality. That's what your happiness is based on. Not trying to get people like you to get, to get more brownie points for yourself. People have it all mixed up. You follow me for a second? A nutritarian tries to eat foods that are good for their body. And we're very creative creating recipes that taste great, but also are good for us. That's what you want to strive for. The prescription here is to eat a big salad every day, because salads link to enhanced longevity. A nutritarian eats a large salad every day. Take out when you go home. A, you know, take out a index card and a marker, and write on the index card, the salad is the main dish, and tape it right onto your refrigerator, the salad is the main dish, and at least once a day, have a big meal for your salad is the main dish. You know? And eat at least an ounce of raw nuts and seeds a day, and possibly at least a half an ounce of nuts and seeds with that big salad to help maximize and facilitate the absorption of those anti-cancer phytonutrients. And have at least a half a cup of beans every day. Start with lower amounts if you get indigestion, you're not used to eating beans, but as you eat them regularly on an ongoing basis, your body gets better and better at it. Have a big serving of cooked vegetables, including screen, cooked greens every day, and have some mushrooms and onions every day too. And your mushrooms, are, and your mushrooms should be cooked. You want to eat all these foods every day to get the nutrients into your brain because we want the full portfolio of anti-cancer foods in our diet. And when we put the full portfolio of anti-cancer foods in the diet, that makes it most easy to lose weight and to control your appetite. And three fresh fruits a day, at least one should be berries or pomegranates or kumquats or some low-sugar fruits. So what I'm saying here is when you're a white belt, when you're just starting out with this, you're going to feel ill. You're not going to feel that great. You're going to be detoxifying. This is not going to make you feel better when you change your diet to a healthy diet. You're going to feel worse, not better. And that, that keeps going for at least a week. Then it goes away and you feel a lot better. When you're a yellow belt, you didn't get rid of your emotional attraction to eating junk food. This still is not easy. You're feeling better, but you're still attracted to those trigger foods that could still derail you and get you in trouble. You've got to watch yourself in this fragile period as a yellow belt in the first month or two. 
But then you're doing this a while, you're a brown belt, you're getting back in touch with true hunger, which take a few months, you're better in control of your apostat, you're losing your emotional addiction to foods, but you're starting to enjoy this food more, but you get to be a black belt, maybe a year goes by now, you've lost 100 pounds, and you're feeling great. Why don't you go celebrate at a restaurant and have some barbecued ribs and cheesecake a la mode? Well, what's going to happen if you do that? What's going to happen when you go have that food that you thought, oh, I used to like these foods. Maybe I'll supply myself with some, with some treat. Well, now you're eating those foods and <coughs> you can't, it tastes horrible. Your taste got too strong. It's so overly salted and overly flavored that you can't even put it in your mouth. And you try to have that ice cream and you can taste the bleach that they used to clean the damn machine and the chemicals in it. And you don't even want it anymore, it's too sweet. And then because a little bit you had, you're up all night trying to drink water because you can't even sleep because you're so thirsty because you had those first two bites anyway. Because now that you're a nutritarian and you're a black belt, you feel so ill if you just eat something unhealthy because your body becomes very reactive and so you want to get rid of any toxins right away. Don't forget when you're a white belt, you felt great when you were eating junk. You felt ill when you tried to eat healthy. Now that you're a black belt, you feel good all the time, but you only feel bad if you try to eat something unhealthily. And you don't want to do that. You get a negative incentive to do that anymore. And you are enjoying your healthy foods most. I'd much rather have my vanilla ice cream at home that I love, made with frozen banana, some macadamia nuts, with some real vanilla bean powder, and the real vanilla bean powder made from real organic vanilla beans has anti-cancer potential. I don't want, that's, taste the most, that's the best tasting to me. I can taste those flavors. I don't want the chemicalized ice cream that's so high in sugar with those chemicals. And I can taste the chemicals and the sugar is overpowering. I don't want to eat that. And you know what? When people do this, it really works great. Here's Scott, told you he lost 300 pounds. I have so many people that have lost more than 200 pounds. It's somewhat utterly amazing. And they've kept it off because he's kept this weight off for now for more than 10 years. And look at Ronnie. He lost 140 pounds in 12 months. You know what happened to Ronnie? First he had bypass, coronary artery bypass surgery with heart disease. Then four years later it reoccluded and he had a quadruple angioplasty, four stents placed after his bypass surgery. Three weeks after the stents were placed, he had restenosis and so severe that he couldn't walk or hardly talk. And they put him on nitrates and sent him home to die on various medications. He Googled reverse heart disease, never met him, communicated with me through the Ask the Doctor form at drfurman.com. He lost 120 pounds, got rid of his heart disease, his cholesterol, his blood pressure, which was high in medication, disappeared on no medication. His LDL, which was about 140 on statins, was now 70 on no statins. His chest pains went away. He has an opportunity to have a new life. He's having a new opportunity. Like Bill. Bill said, I ate all day long. All day long. Kept eating all day. He didn't even see that he was obese, but he's on medications for high blood pressure and depression. Of course, he lost over 100 pounds. But now he loves the way the food tastes, you know? He's now, every one of these people always say the same thing. They always say they're more alert and the fog lifted. They always say the term the fog lifted from their brain, whatever that means. They're thinking more clearly. This lecture tonight, today, was derived from two books. The End of Dieting, talking about food addiction and overeating and, and emotional eating, and Fast Food Genocide, which talks more about the damage of fast food in underserved communities and how fast food leads to crime and, re and, and bigotry and drug addiction and reduces people's human potential and we're having a horrible, almost gen genocide happening to populations because we're not educating people on the importance of eating right and we're not supplying them the ability to eat the right foods and we're taking away their ability to, to achieve their human potential. So that was the book that we've talked about today as well. And my specialty, by the way, I'm just showing this picture of my retreat in San Diego. My specialty is to take people who are troubled and who yo-yoed their weight 
and, tr and know they should, and they're diabetic or they're overweight or they have heart disease or serious illnesses like asthma or autoimmune conditions. And they know they should do better, but they've had trouble and they can't. And they've tried to do better and they couldn't. And we've put together a program through therapy, through food addiction therapy, and keeping people away from their addictions long enough, and training them how to make this taste great, and giving them the knowledge they need, so when they're set free, they're not locked up. <laughs> it's funny because I used to do this in my home, I used to have a rental house near my home in Flemington in New Jersey, and I remember one guy coming in, and he, was, he smoked cigarettes and he wasn't opiates, and I would take away their car keys, I would take away their wallets, and I would, um, you know, so, with it, so they wouldn't be, have a chance, they could walk around town, but they had no money and no car keys and no credit cards, so they couldn't buy anything. So remember this guy, he came back in about three days later, and he said, I changed my mind, I want to go home. I can't come off the cigarettes, I can come off the opiates, but I can't come off the cigarettes, you've got to give me my cigarettes back, or I'm leaving. So I said, number one, you're not leaving, and number two, you're not getting your cigarettes back, because I'm going to save your life here. And he started cursing me out. You never saw the words he threw at me. I didn't know they existed. <laughs> so I said, you signed something that said I shouldn't, give you, I shouldn't let you leave or give your cigarettes back unless a family member of yours agrees with you. So let's get them on the phone and see if your family member supports you to leave. Then you can go, I'll give you back your car keys and your cigarettes. He wound up staying there because he couldn't get anybody to agree that he should leave, and I didn't let him leave. <laughs> and he became one of my best friends and best supporters up till today's date, he's on the he's one on one of the um, donors and on my one of the board of my nutritional research foundation, and he feels like I saved his life, and he'll never forget how I didn't give in and I saved his life and gave him the life he has today. Just to, right? I could have easily gave in, so I got it to, before I, I got it. So one person was at my um, my health retreat last year. And she lost 50 pounds in the first five, six weeks, right? The year she got, went home and left, she lost 150 more pounds. 200 pounds in one year. She would have never lost that weight. Almost every person I see says to me, if I stayed there a month, I probably wouldn't have done it. I probably wouldn't have been able to do this. And you know, the first three weeks, I hated the food. It usually took a while for them to rotate. It took a while for them to like it, but it took a while for their personalities to change. And here's what I'm telling you. That these people, they change as human beings. They get, they're starting to, they get more friendly, more excited about life. They're able to finally do this. And we reach them. But it takes time. And sometimes people need help. But you know what? We're here to help the people that need help the most, right? And we're in this together. And I'm encouraging every one of you to put on your oxygen mask, get those superpowers of super good health, be a role model for other people, feel good about yourself, and then let's all together reach out, like we are doing, and try to help other people get healthier too, right? Because it's going to change the whole world. Because this attitude of living for the moment and living for instant gratification is ruining our political system as well, you know? destroying our environment as well, and it's all interrelated. And the food's a big part of it. And when somebody goes into a nightclub or a movie theater and starts shooting up people, who's talking about their fast food diet that contributed to that? Nobody. Nobody, right? It's beyond, it's under the radar. All right, well, good luck to you guys. <laughs> Wishing you great health and much happiness always. Thank you.